Hello, welcome to another episode of Movies About Music. Yeah, welcome everybody. This is Cece Kim and... This is Jim Bacho. And we just finished watching Almost Famous. Mm-hmm. And I feel a bit like it's a long movie that we watched the full, uh, I guess, director's cut version of it. Oh, did we? Yeah. So it's like two hours and 40 minutes long. This is a very beloved movie um, Mm. by people. Have you seen it before? Yes. When it came out. When it came out. Mm. And do we know what year this movie is? 2000. 2000. Mm -hmm. 2000 was a great year for movies. I've seen it twice. Mm -hmm. I saw it once when it came out. And then I saw it again... When I was working for DigiDesign, mm. we had like a getaway retreat or something, and mm. the whole staff watched the movie. Oh, was there a reason? Because it's for a rock and roll. Oh, DigiDesign okay, made it. Pro Tools. It's a rock and roll okay. company. But I wasn't really paying attention that time because, mm-hmm. I don't know, we were doing other things and mm-hmm, having, having side conversations and yeah. stuff. I mean, I really like this movie. Mm-hmm. But I feel like this third time was the most enjoyable. I don't know mm-hmm. why. Mm-hmm. It's the soundtrack, first mm, of all. Yeah. It's just incredible. Mm-hmm. All of this great music from the from the 1970s and some nice gems. It starts off with Simon and Garfunkel mm-hmm. talking. You know, there's a conversation about Simon and Garfunkel. Then there's Philip Seymour Hoffman, yeah. <laughs> who's strangely like, he's sort of like the, the Obi-Wan Kenobi of the movie. Uh-huh. He's the Cream Magazine editor. Is mm-hmm. it Cream Magazine? Yeah, Cream yeah. And uh, he sort of is giving advice to our young Mm -hmm. protagonist, Mm -hmm. William. But he has this great early speech about rock and roll. Mm -hmm. And he throws out certain bands like he says, yes, no. And he throws (laughs) out, um, I forget who else. He's really into the Guess Who, Iggy Pop. Mm -hmm. And he throws out these, um, I don't know, these bands that are trying too hard or something. Right. Then there's his sister gives away the LPs Mm -hmm. to him and we get to leaf through the LPs. And it's very much like the LPs that my Mm -hmm. parents had Mm -hmm. when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this just all, and while all of this music is playing and it's Mm -hmm. just, you know, other movies have done this, Mm -hmm. but it's just really nice. It's that Mm -hmm. 1974, 1973, 1974. Mm -hmm. 1973. Yeah. I think maybe you liked it because it was kind of your era of music, right? And this is kind of the genre that you were really into. Yeah, the 70s is my mm-hmm. favorite era for music, mm-hmm. for sure. Mm-hmm. So you got really excited about some of the songs that they were playing. Yeah, and I was I was naming some of them mm-hmm. for you. I yeah. <laughs> this movie, it's technically, in all technicality, it's totally the soul and the core of this movie is is a movie about music. Definitely. Yeah. It's a movie about rock and roll. And it's a movie about musicians and uh, groupies or band-aids, as they call themselves, right? Um, Mm -hmm. But in certain circles, it's considered a movie about fashion. It's considered a fashion movie. Ah. And so that's why this movie has such a cult following. Okay. Especially in my generation. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. It's a 90s, it's a late 90s, 90s, early 2000s interpretation of the 70s mm-hmm. which was considered like really that was something that was really in when i was a teenager mm. and we used to read like sassy magazine which was a teen magazine mm-hmm. that famously had kurt cobain and courtney love on the cover one year okay but it, it, it was a fashion magazine it was like a girly magazine but it was for these rock chicks right mm-hmm. and some of the outfits i thought that everything that everybody was wearing was so cool. Mm. And I was just like, I can't wait. And I, this movie probably prompted me, which was one of the movies that prompted me to dress like a complete weirdo mm. during the early 2000s. Oh, I wish I could have seen that, actually. Like, I only wore clothes that were really old. Mm-hmm. You know, and that... Yeah, the kind of the retro mm -hmm. um, found in the closet kind Mm -hmm. of aesthetic, right? Yeah. With these movies, you know, there's the time that it's made and then Mm -hmm. the time that it's reflecting. So Mm -hmm. this is 2000 of 1973, 1974. Yes. And this is Cameron Mm Crowe. He's also directed Jerry Maguire. Mm Mm-hmm. He directed um, Fast Times at Ridgemont. No, sorry. He didn't direct Fast Times at Ridgemont High. I think he wrote it or co-wrote it or something. And if I understand his biography right, he was a writer for Rolling Stone as a kid. Oh, I had no idea. So So it's semi-autobiographical. So it's Uh semi-autobiographical. And I think it's interesting that Cameron Crowe eventually, you know, this this young rock critic, you can imagine William being him. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, it's 
very dramatized. Mm -hmm. I hope I'm getting my history right. Then eventually he goes and he marries Nancy Wilson of Heart, mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. of the most popular mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. rock and roll mm -hmm. bands in the yeah. 1970s and 80s. I don't know. It's interesting. I, ca I was kind of thinking about how much of this was real to his life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't really need that, that background to get into the movie, but it is a semi-autobiographical movie. Mm -hmm. And so they have all of that, you know, Rolling Stone headquarters is in mm -hmm. San Francisco, where a lot of the center of the music was happening. The Rolling Stone thing is interesting um, because there's, it's almost like Cream magazine is off, is offset by Rolling Stone magazine. Mm -hmm. Cream is the, I guess the, you know, they do kind of trashier kind of mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. rock band features. And then Rolling Stone is the kind of the more corporate right, right. Uh, vehicle by this time. Mm -hmm. And it's just kind of interesting because I've I have a I have a lot of problems with Rolling Stone magazine. Mm -hmm. um, it was very big even for me. I don't know was Rolling Stone a thing when you were growing up? Y yes, yes, but nobody really took it seriously. Okay, it was really at by that time. I think I'm mean, I'm just speaking for myself, but nobody was really like, oh, this there's this cool feature and who's know? on the cover? Because yeah. for me, it was who's on the cover of Rolling Stone this mm -hmm. month. Well, I think the the movie touches on this, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, the Philip Seymour Hoffman uh, character. I forgot his character name because yeah, he's know. such a presence, right? Yeah. This actor is such a fucking presence. He says, well, you're coming at this um, during the end, the tail end of rock and roll. Yeah. It's going to be over soon. Everything we love about rock and roll is gone. And he doesn't specify what that is. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm sure it had a lot to do with what Rolling Stone became. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that was an interesting statement. And there's, it's actually in the movie, there's a lot of interesting statements like mm -hmm. that. You hear somebody talk about flying cars mm -hmm. in 20 years. Oh, Mick Jagger. Mick, oh, when Mick, Mick Jagger, who, you know, Mick Jagger is not going to be touring at age 50. Yeah. Yeah. He's not going to be a rock star when he's 50. Right, right. <laughs> um, that was Jimmy Fallon's line, right? And then there was... Um, there's, they've got this amazing device now that will transcribe your notes mm -hmm. in 18 minutes a, a page. page. yeah. <laughs> That's funny. So there's all these little references. But I thought that what you're talking about was an interesting kind of thing because in a sense, it did go downhill from there. Mm -hmm. um, but in a sense, it was also, there was, there was a lot more to come in the 70s. It also brings me back to a line in the movie American Graffiti, when he says, rock and roll's over, man. And this mm -hmm. is like 1959 or something like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Little, you know, did they know what was going to happen in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Rolling Stone was a big part of, of my life. And my dad used to send me Rolling mm -hmm. Stones, like when I was in college and stuff like that. Um, so it was a big presence. And still in 2000, I think it was a, it was a big deal, but it becomes so corporate. I think that the moment when I saw Sting, an ad selling Jaguar cars mm -hmm. in Rolling Stone, okay, that's when I was yeah. done with it. And as a and as a like a twenty year old mm -hmm. kid, I was you know actually like late twenties. I'd sort of given up on it, I think, because it becomes so corporate, mm -hmm. and it was really making fun of a lot of the music that I liked. Mm. So Rolling Stone had its own kind of definition of what rock and roll was, mm -hmm. and it was the Rolling Stones, mm -hmm. Bob Dylan, the Who, the Beatles, and then you know like Fleetwood Mac and and mm -hmm. things like this. And they were always supportive of the bands that were doing drugs and and um, being rock and roll bands. Mm -hmm. And it's like, this has nothing to do with music. Mm -hmm. So I always had this kind of antagonistic relationship with Rolling Stone. But they were known for doing very good covers, mm -hmm. cover yeah, stories. Yeah, for sure. So I remember like I really got into Sinead O'Connor when she first came out. Mm -hmm. And Rolling Stone did the cover story on her. And it was one of the best things I've ever read in my life. Mm -hmm. And it made me like Sinead O'Connor even mm -hmm. more through that. So they had a lot of weight. They had a lot of power. Mm -hmm. This is obviously before then. But um, I just kind of wanted to situate Rolling Stone magazine there because it, and it's also the journalist, you know, the music journalist, mm -hmm. you know, kind of takes those scraps of notes and, you know, works on a typewriter and, and tries to make that story, mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting. But then just following around the band, I kept thinking as I do with movies like this, mm -hmm. you know, how so much of this could never happen today, mm -hmm. you know, because there's, because like of some fun. Well, like, how nothing got out, you know, there's no Instagram, no Facebook, mm -hmm, you know, they, mm -hmm. nothing like that, right. that they just kind of went through it. And then later on, mm -hmm. the story came out, mm -hmm. you know, which is, which is a very foreign concept mm -hmm. these days. I found it interesting. I, I feel like 
there were so many characters that you can identify with and you can follow in the story because it was a long movie and it was sort of, you could see the same events and not a lot of movies do this from different perspectives, depending on who you choose to identify with, depending on who you choose to follow. Mm. One could look at the situation from the perspective of Penny Lane, uh, Kate Hudson's character, um, which I, when I first saw this movie, all I remembered was Penny Lane and her outfits and like what she said and what she did and what she looked like. That's okay. all I remember. Yeah. Can we stop here? Because we have to talk about Kate Hudson, I think, because yes. she's, I, to me, she's the heart and soul of this film. Definitely. Even more yeah. than William. It's just all of the pathos of the movie comes through her. Mm -hmm. I guess he's the reporter. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's mm -hmm. going to, and he's kind of like the journalist who follows the events as they happen, but it's mm -hmm. it's kind of her story. It is, yeah. When I have a memory of this mm -hmm. movie, she's what sticks out, obviously. Right, right. There was so much press about her when this came out, about how she embodied Goldie Hawn, mm. her mother. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Maybe because Goldie Hawn was a filmmaker in, or, or a film actor in the 70s. Mm, I see, okay. I, I didn't even think about that. And she's just, you know, I love first scenes of an mm -hmm. actor in a movie. Mm -hmm. And she just hits it. When she, oh, for sure. Like, yeah. you know, from her first frame, mm -hmm. this this is the star of the movie. Mm -hmm. I, I always thought that there was something magical about her, mm. Kate Hudson. I still think she, there is something just exceptional about Kate Hudson. And in this movie, I think, I think she was like 20 or 22, whatever. A young actress whose mother and her, both her parents are famous. And I think this was like her breakout role. And this is what made her Kate Hudson. For sure. And it was just inevitable. Like, you see this movie, and I, all I remembered was her for when I saw this. Mm -hmm. And there are things that you can miss because you're so kind of, like, captured and enamored with, you know, you just kind of get sucked into this character and this actress. And so for me, the second viewing was much more, I, I, I think I understood the story and, you know, what the film was trying to say a lot more because I was, I mean, I'm used to Kate Hudson now. <laughs> you know, mm. we all are. Mm. And so, I, you know, I was less distracted by mm. this young new actress and there were so many interesting characters. I've also lived 20 more years since then. And there were so many things going on from so many different perspectives. And you could basically see yourself in any single one of those people. That's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. that is a very interesting... Because a lot of movies, I don't know if this is true, but it's kind of set up like from one or two, you know, a selective few people characters and then everybody seems to exist for that those characters yeah film kind of works this way yeah. it's, it's a classic screenplay yeah, yeah. And that's, approach mm -hmm. in script writing what, what you want to do is always have a character that draws us through mm -hmm. a movie so that w someone is pulling us through and and you're right there's like three different people that you can think of mm -hmm. at least three I think. at least three but i was you know i also and, and a lot of things have happened since then in my life and in all of our lives like Philip Seymour Hoffman passed away True. and you notice him more, you know, because mm -hmm. he's so good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's just so good. And a lot of the lines that really touched me came from Philip Seymour Hoffman. Yeah, he and has a this, great speech at the end, too. Totally. And this is how middle-aged I have become. 17-year-old me worshipped Penny Lane and Kate Hudson. All I remembered from that movie was let's go live in Morocco for one year. Yeah. And I, it was just, for some reason, I was blown away by this line. And I was just like, oh my God, I want to be exactly like her. And you kind of did do that. Yeah. And, and the thing is, like, she says, let's go there and be completely different people mm -hmm. and di just disappear. And right. I think that was sort of like the beginning of my obsession with disappearing. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean, because yeah. every time I go to a different country, I think, okay, now I can reinvent myself. Totally. And back when I started doing that, uh, it was possible to do that because there was mm. no, you know, there, there was no trace of me online, you know, like we didn't yeah. really live our lives like publicly right. like we do anymore. Um, and so that was a very romantic and attractive um, mm. idea for me that I kind of lived by and I ended up living by. But now the 38-year-old me was like so moved by Frances McDormand, <laughs> who is the mother of William. Yeah. And I didn't even remember this character. Mm -hmm. 
from my first viewing, but I was just like, this woman completely, utterly devoted to raising her children a certain mm. way that she believes is yeah. right. And she's this independent, like the father died of mm -hmm. something, um, and then she had to raise these two kids mm -hmm. on her own, and she's a university professor mm -hmm. in like the late 60s right. and 70s. Right. An extremely intelligent woman. I think she like teaches philosophy, I don't know, like psychology or something. Well, it seemed like she was teaching a psychology class, but mm -hmm. she said she taught English. Um, oh, okay, that makes sense. But she also has like the um, the serenity prayer on the mm -hmm, wall of mm -hmm, the living room, mm -hmm. you know. And I loved how she decorated the house. It was like a humble mm. California home that mm -hmm. looked cozy and inviting and it was just like mom, you know. So what were some of the things that like as, as the story went, like what are some of the things how you were relating to her character? Well, the the basic plot is that, yeah, I feel like we need to explain this. Um, spoiler alert, William, the protagonist, is 15 years old, and he is um, hired through a series of events. Through a series of events. He is hired by Rolling Stone to go on tour with this band called Stillwater and write an article about them. And he needs to get an interview with... Russell, who is Billy Crudup. Mm -hmm. The star guitar player yeah, the who star, outshines the, the lead, lead singer. singer. Yeah. And that's his main goal throughout the entire movie. And he promises his mother, he's still in high school. He skipped a couple of grades, but he, so he's about to graduate. But he promises his mother that he would be back for, you know, all of his tests or whatever. And she lets him go, mm -hmm. right? Reluctantly. And reluctantly. Very reluctantly. Yes. And this is the 70s, so, you know, they're doing, she knows that they're doing drugs mm -hmm. and they're getting into all kinds of trouble, like no good. And so she, but she loves him and she wants him to have this experience. So mm. she lets him go right. and she's completely, I, I was just like imagining her anxiety, like every day that he's not home and he's mm -hmm. like out doing God knows what with God knows whom, this innocent little boy of 15. Who... She also lost her daughter right. who left home mm -hmm. early. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's that as well. Yeah, because she's also like a well-meaning, albeit uh, very controlling <laughs> True. mother. And so the daughter, who is played by Zoe Deschanel, leaves to become a flight attendant, mm -hmm. um, leaves home. And so she is kind of like distraught, but then she kind of, this is not, this was never spoken, but I feel like she kind of comes to terms. She, mm -hmm. there is an arc in her story too. Yeah. I think I she comes it, to yeah. understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. then there's kind of like a, yeah, like a forgiveness at mm -hmm. the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she's such a good actor. I, um, yeah. I just want to identify one scene. Mm -hmm. at the graduation scene. Mm -hmm. He doesn't show up for his graduation, mm -hmm. but she does. Mm -hmm. They name him and they say he can't be there. <laughs> you know, the camera hold. It, I noticed that it was um, John Toll mm -hmm. was the director of photography, and he's one of my favorite, favorite DPs. It kind of holds on her face and she, you know, kind of claps. And then she continues to look on mm -hmm. and like her eyes are looking at the mm -hmm. person speaking. Mm -hmm. And then they dip down a little bit. Yeah. And then the guy keeps speaking and then her eyes dip down a little bit more. Mm -hmm. That's just genius yeah. acting. I just love that moment because she's thinking about him. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Right? She's a mother who loves her children, who's trying to do her best and what she knows is best. And in the end, I feel like, I mean, this is not explicitly expressed, but I feel like she just wants her children to be decent people. And she has this um, weird speech That's with it. the Russell character, right? Mm -hmm. That and was a great yeah. scene. He thought he was going to... Yeah. But basically, he tells him, it's not too late for you, Russell. You can be right. a decent person, right? Right, and that went totally over my seventeen-year-old head because I wanted to be cool. Yeah, well, we should talk about the two yeah. worlds that are going yeah, on yeah. here because you're kind of addressing like this aspect of the two worlds and the idea of mm -hmm. home, mm -hmm. right? It's kind of like I guess you know the the, the classic story of going out on a on an odyssey and mm -hmm. then returning home. It fulfills that uh, that classic arc. This idea of, of home and belonging somewhere, mm -hmm. if there's one fault of the film mm -hmm. that I, I could point out, it's that he doesn't seem that affected. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's the acting, maybe it's the way the character was rendered. But this is the time of his life. Mm -hmm. This is the one experience that he's going to have as a 15-year-old kid 
that is absolutely incredible. Mm-hmm. And he he is offered a home. We could say it's a false mm-hmm. home, you know, that they're just using him. Mm-hmm. But he completely enters into this world mm-hmm. that he's always been in love with. Mm-hmm. And there's a strange distance, but I think maybe this is played with, you know, in the idea that the writer has to have yeah. a kind of distance. And it's essentially, I feel like it's because it's not his story. It's Penny Lane's story. Yeah. The, this idea of a false home and false friends and a fake, you know, True. And, fantasy and I, existence. Yeah. I guess all four of those characters are dealing with this issue of, mm-hmm. of belonging and home. Mm-hmm. And if we bring it back to music, so Russell even feels outside of his own band because he's apparently this brilliant guitar player. Mm -hmm. The lead singer started the band, Mm -hmm. but he's the talent, Mm -hmm. right? So even he feels out of element Mm -hmm. with the band. You know, a band can be a home. It can be a whole culture. It can be a whole thing. It can be a whole existence. It can be a whole identity. Mm -hmm. Uh, And you've got so many players in it, not just the musicians, but you've also got the managers and the the tour managers Mm -hmm. and all of that um, happening. And so he just, he really does, it's like this... Odyssean kind of journey. Mm-hmm. He, it's, it's like you know, you could say it's akin to somebody who goes off to war in a sense of um, just completely entering a different mm-hmm. world mm-hmm. that he's outside of and mm-hmm. unprepared for. So I thought that was interesting. Um, I, I kind of want to get to some of these, um, get dig a little deeper into Penny Lane's character because this is a movie about music mm-hmm. in which she is a fan of music. Mm-hmm, yeah. But we should talk about what it means to be a fan of music. Mm -hmm. Um, It's probably a generational difference Mm -hmm. um, with the 1970s to what we can think of as now. Mm -hmm. But there were these people who really lived for the band. Mm -hmm. And she's exploring that culture. She's embodying that culture. And Mm -hmm. we're seeing that culture through her. Some of the complexities of her character and the emotions of her character. Mm -hmm. I just thought she was brilliant in this Mm -hmm. movie. Yeah, yeah. What does it mean to be a music fan to that degree? I mean, I've never in my life experienced it. I mean, it is it exists till this day in like, especially in, I hate to bring this up, but it, it totally exists in K-pop. There are people who live for, you know, some of these bands, if you can call them bands. Some people, there are people, there are fans who really live for um, some of these boy bands or girl brands. And they take it really seriously and it's a lifestyle and they're completely devoted. Um, obviously, I don't get that. In my lifetime, I've never been able to follow around or even, you know, take any of the bands seriously that I like either they were too they were too accessible or they were like not at all like mm, yeah. in, like contemporary right so this is something that I've never witnessed but but these people are not just fans right, right? These, these these are people who have devo- almost devoted their lives like yeah. you know there's people who would follow the Grateful Dead around mm-hmm. they're, they're you know the deadheads mm-hmm. are obviously famous for this it becomes their community I don't know I just found her character to be extremely complex Mm-hmm. And and the idea of love, mm-hmm. you know, how much can we say is this love? Mm-hmm. How much is she sort of going out and just trying to experience, you mm-hmm. know, she's actually, I think the difference today would probably be, you know, that all of the fandom now is lived by by the screen. Right. But then that's how most of us did it, right? We collected mm-hmm. magazines, it's really not that much difference. But I don't think that there are band aids now, are there? Maybe there are. I would say that there are prob- there's probably like way too much security. Yeah, so that's yeah, the other thing. for that to even like begin to happen cuz n- today they would just be called psychotic stalkers like <laughs> 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 But I do remember being deeply affected by music though. Yeah, me to, too. To the point where it's just like you can't like you just can't with yourself. Like you right. can't handle how much you love this music yeah and you know the people who wrote this fucking music yeah. um i remember that actually i was listening to an interview with the um one of the members of jellyfish mm-hmm. um the band jellyfish and he said something that i've never heard somebody say that completely captured what it is for me mm-hmm. he said i want a song to be something that i can live inside of mm-hmm. for the music that he truly truly loves and this is my mm-hmm. feeling too that I have to completely enter into it. Mm-hmm. And so I would not be the Philip Seymour Hoffman character. Mm-hmm. Like for me, music is not something that's a reflection of my attitude. Mm-hmm. 
I live inside of the music. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, for someone like Penny Lane, she, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know, is she, how much does she really love the music? That's really not addressed. Right. Um, yeah. And how much of it is she loving the lifestyle, you know? It was, the music was addressed by another groupie, and that's who I'm quoting. So, okay, yeah. yeah. So that, I'm glad you mentioned that yeah. because I thought about that at, mm -hmm. at the end, mm -hmm. and I can't remember the name of her character. She was kind of the third. Mm hmm. Like there's Anna Paquin, mm -hmm. Kate Hudson, and then there's a third, and I did, yeah. never really got her name. But right. she has the great line at the end. It, she basically said what I just said, like, you know, yeah. that they don't, wow, look at these new girls. They don't know what it's like to love this music so much that That's it hurts it. that you don't know what to do with yourself. That's it. So they, she was implying that they were in for the ride, the yeah, lifestyle, yeah, yeah. and the, the fun. Right. Whereas they are not. They're right. really devoted to the music. Mm -hmm. With Penny Lane, that was never explicitly addressed. With a lot of the famous groupies um, in the 70s, they loved the music, but they were also kind of like these stars themselves. They mm -hmm. were famous. They mm -hmm. were... Um, probably in it for a lot of things it could have started with the music and then it became like sort of a persona that they yeah. adapted and i think with penny lane she represented those groupies who became sort of like the iconic groupies you know you're of, reminding me actually i think that she, her character was based on a real person who mm -hmm. was a, a famous groupie sorry band-aid mm -hmm. like this mm -hmm. who was a groupie of led zeppelin and i think oh yeah i think i heard about she this, had a yeah. relationship with jimmy page i mm -hmm. think yeah, and, yeah but other bands as well mm -hmm. so i think she's based on a real character mm -hmm. and we're back so, Cece, yes. I have a question for you, because I really do love this movie. I mean, obviously, this movie is a love of music, right? Mm -hmm. But what do you think Cameron Crowe is trying to say about music? Mm, this is what I think. I don't think he's trying to really say anything specifically. Mm -hmm. But what I got from especially Philip Seymour Hoffman's uh, character and the way things ended up. Yeah is that rock and roll is about freedom. And once the money making and all that goes into it, mm -hmm. it ruins the whole thing. Right. And the band goes back to touring on a bus, right? Mm -hmm. Because the plane, the private plane that the new manager who was played by Jimmy Fallon suggested would... What did, what did we think of Jimmy Fallon in the movie? I don't know if he was trying to act <laughs> badly. I don't... I. I, but it, it, it was so bad that it was almost good because I was. It made me think like, is he? Is this part of the character to be so awkward and deliver the lines? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I have a weird. I, I'm not a big fan of Jimmy Fallon. Oh, me he, neither. He just to me he constantly sounds drunk, mm -hmm. and um, he just feels awkward to me. I, For me, he feels insincere in everything. He yeah. Does. Okay. So maybe it's that. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. So. The, the plane, I think, signifies something because that is the main event. Like, that's the climax oh, that's of the, the plot, right? Yeah. Uh, they almost get into a plane crash. They almost die. And everything plane. comes out. It's yeah. almost like the uh, the rupture moment in psychoanalysis or something mm -hmm, where all of a sudden yeah. everybody's... Because there's a lot of buried um, issues with this band right. and, the, and between the band members. And it all comes out in the plane. Mm -hmm. And the Jimmy Fallon character initially suggested that they take the private plane because they would they could add more dates to mm -hmm. their tour and make more money that way. So they almost die, and then yeah. they in the end they end up going back to the tour bus and going back to what they wanted to do in the first place, which was to just play music. Yeah, that's that's true. I didn't even think of that. It's kind of the apex of the movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they get into the storm and then. Oh, I slept with your wife, and because mm -hmm. they all thought they were gonna die, mm -hmm. everything kind of comes out. It's yeah, it's an interesting way of kind of pulling these conflicts together. There's a repeating idea of keeping it real. Mm -hmm. Philip Seymour Hoffman talks about it. Mm -hmm. Russell talks about it, and it's always this kind of underlying theme. And it's it's something with rock and roll, I think. And during that time, mm -hmm. I don't know what rock and roll is now, but during that time. There's this idea of keeping it real. And Rolling Stone embodied that very much. This is mm -hmm. why Rolling Stone hated bands like Yes and Genesis. <laughs> because they didn't, you know, they didn't think that they were keeping it real. But yeah, that that idea of kind of I I guess an authenticity to the experience of rock and roll. And what is that in your opinion? 
I mean, for me personally, I, I don't, again, I mentioned the idea of living inside a world. I don't want music to be real. I, I, I don't want yeah. it to be, I mean, in the sense of, because there's this, there's also a theme of cool in the movie. Mm-hmm. So also connected to the idea of rock mm-hmm. and roll is the idea of cool. Mm-hmm. And I've never been into the idea of cool with rock and roll. I just like to feel it. <laughs> right, right. Uh, but I think that's what what cool is. Okay, so maybe mm, okay. The, the irony is that I found that the Philip Seymour Hoffman character was so cool to me. Like he mm. was so cool. He was one of those guys who just talk and talk and talk and everything they say is like gold. Is right yeah, on true. the money. The, his character, and he was one. He's one of those pot-bellied dudes who are kind of balding, but then they still get laid all mm. the time. Like he's one of those. For me, that's it's, how he came across. What, what does he say? He's got that great bit about. Um, <laughs> it was ab- perfect about yeah. how about how cool people. If you what, what was you oh know what he I'm was like about? we're not cool Let's see, don't be friends with these people right. they're not your friends mm-hmm. and you know the, it basically was like they will hurt you we're not cool and he was like we're the smart ones who have substance who endure they you know pretty people they have no spine <laughs> yeah it was almost like the pretty people don't need music no it wasn't even about music it was just like they don't make art. Yeah, 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 it's that was the it. people, it's us who are like that was heartbroken it. and not popular who didn't get the girl. Right, that, and that's who, so right? true. Yeah. That's why that's why we turn to music and turn to yeah. all of these. That's how I think geek culture happens too. For sure, too. and that there's something, I don't know if this is a generational thing, but that definitely has become cool now. The kids nowadays, I feel like they celebrate diversity more and they, they kind of, there's more to being popular and cool now Mm -hmm. than there was like in the 90s i think okay which is when this movie i see this as a very 90s movie okay yeah i mean yeah 2000 so it's yeah you would consider it a 90s movie i think yeah and i think like there's something very uncool about holding on to being cool Mm -hmm. that's true Especially at my age. I think. That's why you see managers who who are dressed like, yeah. you know, rock stars. He, again, the Jimmy Fallon character. Mm. There's no way that he can be cool. Right. Maybe it's kind of a joke on the casting yeah, team to, I don't know. to get I, Jimmy Fallon to it, do it. it just, but this was, you know, once again, a 90s movie. Then, yeah. then, and movies back then used to be a little bit more literal. Mm-hmm. And less meta than yeah, they true. are now. True. It did make me think about what's cool and what's authentic and what's rock and roll and what touches people, what inspires people, and what makes people want to follow them around mm-hmm. and devote their lives to, you know, a band or whatever. Um, I think the reason we don't see that nowadays is because there's something so lame about a band that has become like very corporate. Being rich is inherently so uncool and so not rock and roll. Mm-hmm. But then they, a lot of them got rich, didn't they? And they became fucking lame. Yeah. Because being rich is a little lame. It's a little uncool. It's a little bit, you know, you're conforming and you're, right. you know, middle-aged. And But it seems like today, and, you know, I hate to turn this into a you kids shaking my walking stick thing, but um, that, that that is what's real today, is that there's so much of it is careerism right now, it feels like, and, mm. it, and that's celebrated. You, you know, we, we right. talked before about BTS, and, you know, a lot of these, a lot of the music seems to be a, um, a career right. rather than a spirit. Right. And, and I think that it's part of it may be that we live in such a knowledge-based world, we live in such a fact-based mm-hmm. world, we live in such a reality-based world that... The mysticism of what rock and roll is, the mm-hmm. spirit of that music, I don't think exists as much anymore. I'm going to stop you right there because sure. I'm going to point out two things that yeah. are very important. And these are there are two reasons why you think this way. Because Uh-oh. A, you don't know any of the cool people anymore. You don't know <laughs> any of the cool young kids. They are not in within your reach or within your... They're not on Facebook. They are not, you know, you don't okay. know them. Are, are they in reach? Of, are you in reach of no, them? No, I'm not. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay. We don't know them. But I know vaguely that they exist. Well, I thought you were going to tell me what it is because no. I would like to know. No, 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 no. But I know that that it's out there. There are, you know, the 20... The you Gen think there's Sears. a spirit. You think there's there's like a real... There's yeah. there's something... No, there are countercultures out there. Like I've seen it in like Brooklyn. I've seen it in Australia. 
Okay, but here's yeah. the difference. Here's the difference. And I think it's another key scene in this movie that I thought of when they were in the bus. Mm -hmm. And this could only happen in the bus, not on the plane, mm -hmm. to your point. Mm -hmm. Elton John's Tiny Dancer comes on. Mm -hmm. And they're in a funk. Mm -hmm. They're having a hard time. One by one, I think the bass player starts singing it. And then everybody, it's, it's a classic scene in the film. Eventually, everybody's sing, singing the song. They all start smiling. Everything's, that's what I'm talking about, the spirit. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows that song. Right. Right? It's a song played with instruments, mm -hmm. you know, and and it's, um, you know, it was just kind of a narrower world of music then. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody could go off and have their independent indie thing mm -hmm. and have their little tribe. But in terms of, I mean, like a like a communal spirit right. of the time, you know, a zeitgeist, a mm -hmm. spirit of the times. I don't know that that exists so but much now. But there's probably less of that, but there's definitely, the youth is still out there doing their youth thing. Sure. That's the point that I'm trying to yeah. make. And I never want to assume that anything is gone because... The young will be young, you know? Yeah, that's true. And they will be cool. Uh, we are middle-aged, so we're out of touch from this culture. And I admit that, and I think it's very important to acknowledge that. Number two, mm -hmm. that we live in Asia where this counterculture is very hard to find, and it's not visible. The youth in Asia, I think, is very different culturally. We're really, like, we're very compliant. We're relatively... Well, I don't, I'm not the youth of Asia anymore, but um, I see so much conformity and it's like a lot of things are like just, okay, Gen X Koreans were such rebels. There was really? an energy mm -hmm. in the 90s that I wasn't even part of that generation and I could feel. It was just, Gen Xers were crazy. They would not settle the hell down. Like, mm -hmm. and... I don't see any of that. I don't feel any of that from well, the, like my generation or Gen Zers. Like it kind of ended with. Gen so this X. is my point, yeah. right? This is what I was saying. Yeah. Is is and it's interesting that you say this is happening in Korea in the nineties mm -hmm. because it's very much happening in the United States during mm -hmm. the nineties. And this is what I mean about a spirit of the time. I think mm -hmm. you combine everything from the technology of the time, the distribution mm -hmm. at the time, what radio was, what you know, how we consumed music was different. Mm -hmm. I think you're right, and and you're giving the optimistic view um, in terms of the possibility of of, yeah. of that happening mm -hmm. again. I mean, it's almost like a question of can we ever get back the idea of a collective spirit of something right. like where we all sing "Tiny Dancer" mm -hmm. in the bus because we all know it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know because everything to me seems very fragmented. Mm -hmm. And everyone is kind of in individual right. in their consumption of things because mm -hmm. it's very personal and, mm -hmm. and it's less shared. And this kind of thing, I think, is going to become more dangerous the you more we so? isolate from each other. Mm -hmm. And I think this is going to be a theme as long as the pandemic goes on. But there's just a sadness in watching people at a party, mm -hmm. in a movie, you know, kissing each other, mm -hmm. kissing friends, mm -hmm. you know, and, and being together and, mm -hmm. you know, concerts at big places, mm -hmm. you know, and things like that. I mean, I know that's coming back in the States, but it doesn't it doesn't feel the same. Mm -hmm. You know, we've really like, I think you need that kind of openness and you need that kind of community and you need that mm -hmm. sharing of bodies for things to really happen. And I worry about that. I, I mean, know. I'm not too worried, but I mean, I, I just want to point out that we're definitely out of it. Whatever is yeah. going on. Yeah. Right yeah. And what I was that. leading to actually mm -hmm. was to your point is, yeah, there, there's always another up. Mm -hmm. you know, uprising, mm -hmm. uh, um, or sprung. Right. Sorry. That's and I, I really hope that yeah, I hope so too. it's something that is not <laughs> as lame as what I see with my eyes. Like, like for, I'm just going to go ahead and sure. say this. There is nothing lamer than that BTS and Coldplay collaboration. It's like, that was an awful, the most, awful, awful song. The most corporate, bullshit thing that has ever I don't even want to say that it's music and I'm gonna repeat that it, this epiphany that I had the other day with our mutual friend who is a BTS fan mm -hmm. and um, one day she was talking about BTS and somebody asked her like what do you like about them and she was like well I don't like their music <laughs> and she kept on saying that and she said you know I just like their spirit and they're very energetic and they mm -hmm. give me hope you know, and, it's like a product. And I was like, that's fucking propaganda. That's, that's not <laughs> music. That's not a boy band. That That's like, it's like, oh, look at those boys doing so much for our nation. Mm -hmm. Right. 
and they are, you know, honoring us all. I'm like, this is not the kind of music that I want to listen to. It's not something that I want to be part of. If anything, it's so concerning. It reminds me of like, what is this North Korea? And then the thing is that Coldplay collaboration, mind you, it's Coldplay. It is the lamest band ever. I mean, in a sense that it's okay. They're okay. No, I've got a thing about Coldplay. I mean, that first album, Parachutes, oh my God, that is such a great album. It's it's four dudes, basically five instruments. Mm -hmm. Wait. Voice, bass, guitar, keyboards, drums, five instruments, a piano. It's, he's mm-hmm. not even playing keyboards. That is such a passionate album. It's it's mixed beautifully because you can hear every single instrument. And then their second album, to me, it just sucked because mm-hmm. all of a sudden everything got flattened out. I feel like everything I've heard from Coldplay sucked. Okay, so yeah. then continue further and they mm-hmm. just got worse and worse and worse and they got more and more and more and more popular. And you know why? Their music just flattened to this dead space. Because it's propaganda. It's not music. No, I'm saying that this is an epiphany that I had with this BTS fan. I was like, the reason they are so lame is because they are so corporate, right? And it's like anything that appeals to that many people, this is the point that I was trying to make earlier. They are not, They, you know, I can listen to Coldplay. I can listen to BTS, but I don't like it doesn't make me want to like drop everything and go see them in concert or whatever. There is nothing lamer than a Coldplay fan. Everybody listens to Coldplay, right? But like, have you ever met a Coldplay fan? No, I'm too old. But the thing is, the reason they are so lame, it's not their fault. It's just that they have been washed down So much, they have been watered down, and I know this process, I'm very familiar with this watering down of music process that they do in this industry. Mm -hmm. In order to be so palatable to so many people, to like everyone in every single country in the world right now, because that is their reach, they have been insanely watered down. Yeah, that's what I mean by flattening out. Yeah, it's- and, and it's just like, there's something so lame about a rock star that would go through that because rock and roll is supposed to be, we. why do we like them? We like them because they don't have to follow the rules that we follow. They don't have to dedicate their lives to productivity. Their art and their brilliance and their poetry exempts them from this life that Going we are chained to. Going back to Philip Seymour Hoffman's point. Yeah, yeah exactly. But if they themselves sell their music, you know, in a way that Coca-Cola sells their products, it's so lame. Then it's just cultural production. It's exactly. just a product. Yeah. And I, that's what I got. Maybe it's the, the mindset I'm in, the, the state of mind I'm in right now. But that's the message that I got from this movie. Yeah, yeah. So then to kind of bring it back to this idea of music and, mm-hmm. and, and the authenticity of the music presented, I thought it was really cool mm-hmm. that they actually, so this, there, it's about this band Stillwater and they actually made songs for this I band know. in the movie. And it's and so great. they were good. They were good fucking songs. They were good 1970s style mm-hmm. songs. We watched the credits after mm-hmm. the movie. I remember that they had made these original songs for this band. First of all, the technical assistance was done by Peter Frampton, Mm -hmm. who, if you don't know, is a legendary singer, guitar player from the 1970s, just a fantastic musician, fantastic player, fantastic songwriter. And so he was kind of a technical advisor on this. I could see him all over this movie. Mm. And then you've got in the front credits, it has Nancy Wilson as the uh, Mm -hmm. music supervisor or whatever they were calling it. So Nancy Wilson is Cameron Crowe's wife. Mm-hmm. And is also, you know, the guitarist and uh, co-singer, mm-hmm. I guess, mostly backup singer for Heart. And the people who wrote the songs were Cameron Crowe, mm-hmm. Ann Wilson, mm-hmm. and Nancy Wilson. Yeah, yeah. So you've got basically Heart mm-hmm. writing that music. I know, yeah. And it sounded like, to me, like just all of the 1970s mashed up. It, it sounded like Joe Walsh, Neil Young, Bad Company, mm-hmm. uh, all these bands from the 70s kind of in this really open groove almost southern rock kind of very american yes balls out Mm -hmm. 70s rock Mm -hmm. 
And it was great. It's it great was, music. Yeah. It was very believable that it was from an actual band in the 70s. Yeah. It, yeah. it really added to... I, I kind of wish there wasn't much on stage footage, actually. But when they did, it sounded really good. Mm-hmm. Big open drums, awesome guitar leads. I wonder who played guitar. I wonder if it was Peter Frampton who played guitar. But the guitar playing was great. It's funny, you know, this this is going to seem like a weird technical Mm -hmm. geeky thing. But if you look at footage of the 1970s and anyone playing in the 1970s, you know, there's two, you notice there's two microphones taped together. Yeah, 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 totally. And I've always wondered what that was. I think what's happening, and again, don't ever come to me for facts, but I think what's Mm -hmm. happening is they're obviously feeding two different channels. I guess you didn't have the mixer, you didn't have the auxiliary sends in in the mixers or something. Yeah, that means nothing to me. Okay, sorry. (laughs) No, um, it's okay. <laughs> but I think it's because one, maybe one's going to the monitors, one's going to the mains, or maybe one's going to recording and one's going to front of house. I'm not sure. But that then, makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So, but you see yeah. it all the time right. in these, and they got that down. Right. You know, right, right, <laughs> so right. much so that they got the taped mm-hmm. SM57s together. Mm-hmm. But I thought that was kind of cool. And then he gets electrocuted by a microphone. the microphones mm-hmm. and when he grabs onto it. Um, something which I don't think could ever happen now. The power is too well conditioned mm-hmm. now, but in the 1970s, <laughs> it was a little more uh, fragile. Movies about music. I, th- I feel like we should talk a little bit more about Penny Lane. I, you know, yeah. I'm glad you said that because I was yeah. thinking the exact same thing. There's there's something about that character. Mm-hmm. Um if I may, mm-hmm. um, you know, there's the idea, and this is this film was made before this became an idea, mm-hmm. but of the manic pixie dream girl. Mm, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I don't think she is that. I'm curious if you think that she is. So, for people who don't know, the manic pixie dream girl is a trope in film where the woman in the film kind of serves as a means of getting the male character, the protagonist, out of the his personal funk. Okay. growth of the male character she only serves Serves the purpose of yeah right so do you think she's a manic pixie dream girl this is a tricky one because it is my my question my answer is no mine too yeah because she's much more complex than that Mm -hmm. and i feel like this if anything this really is about her journey Mm -hmm. as much as it is about Williams. williams yeah and we don't see it in a literal sense. But mm-hmm. if anything, he's like a mini pixie dream boy. No, but like he could, there could be oh, another movie from another perspective. Yeah. But he is used a little bit in the type of way that women are used in movies. And I really liked that mm-hmm. because this, char- and, and you mentioned that this character was a little bit flat, right? The mm-hmm. William mm-hmm. character yeah, I think so. didn't really react too emotionally. Like he wasn't, he was a little bit like detached. Yeah. And I think. The reason is that this really is Penny's story. Yeah, I think so too. Mm -hmm. There's the one moment I think where, and again, spoils here for the end of the movie, but it's just a brilliant feat of writing Mm -hmm. by Cameron Crowe, is there's this moment when Russell calls Penny Mm. and he says, I want to come to you now. Mm -hmm. And so he says, give me your address. Mm -hmm. She gives him the address of William. Without telling him. Without telling him. So he shows up thinking he's going to see her and he sees William because that's what needed to happen. Right. So William and and Russell had to have this conversation Mm -hmm. at the end of the movie and she pushed it. One could argue that that's a manic pixie dream girl moment to get them to Mm -hmm. resolve their shit, Mm -hmm. but I don't think it is. I I think think it's just, I just think it's her doing the thing that they need to do Mm -hmm. in a way that's different from saving them well i also think that a big element of the manic pixie dream girl is the fate of the manic pixie dream girl in these movies oh, right and usually the manic pixie dream girl goes back to where she was before she met the man mm-hmm. or something bad happens she just kind of disappears she dies i don't know like where she just kind of like right. you know yeah. she doesn't evolve at all mm-hmm. as a person But in the end, Penny Lane does evolve. She's a three-dimensional character, and she also ends up going to Morocco. Well, you know why she goes to Morocco? And back to your point, I didn't even think of this. Mm -hmm. But she goes to Morocco because William said she'll never go to Morocco. Yeah. So he kind of serves Mm -hmm. as the instigator for her to go Mm -hmm. on her journey. So she has her own journey. She has her own growth. And that's a huge element of why I don't think she's a manic pixie dream girl. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, she's she's such a rich character. You were talking about Kate Hudson after that movie. Mm. 
I remember her marrying, I think his name is Chris Blackwell from the, the Black Crows. And, and then I don't think I ever saw her again. Well, she was in a lot of um, quote unquote chick flicks. Okay. <laughs> and she's still magical. I feel like she's mm. still Kate Hudson. You know, you said magical. That's great because she does... Again, she has she has such a magical quality to her. I don't think I've ever used that word about anyone. No, but it's perfect. <laughs> yeah. It's perfect. But there is something magical yeah. about Kate Hudson. And I always thought so. There was something there's something in her smile. Mm-hmm. It's this innate confidence that she has, this unshakable sense of who she is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's the scene when he when William is trying to tell her, Don't you see what's going yep. on? And her face, the turns of emotions in, oh, in her, gosh, like yeah. the same time she's smiling, there's tears running mm-hmm. down her face. It's just brilliant. Yeah. And that says so much about her mm-hmm. her character. Mm-hmm. As a woman, it did not make me feel annoyed to watch this character who's who starts out like the con- the, the idea of a groupie is, you know, kind of degrading. Yeah. But it didn't make me upset in any way how it turned out. And I imagine her going off to Morocco and living a full life, me you too. know, just continuing to charm everybody (laughs) i just wonder i can't help but wonder you know there's always the idea of the muse behind the genius Mm -hmm. or whatever not i'm not saying cameron crowe is a genius i don't i don't Mm -hmm. really like that word very much but uh the muse behind the author of something right you know this happens in every art form Mm -hmm. the history of art is full of unattributed women who have probably informed a lot of the work that men have done Mm -hmm. obviously nancy wilson must have had a huge influence being married to cameron crow Mm -hmm. and you know really probably taking over a lot of what's going on in this film i'm Mm -hmm. sure they had endless conversations Mm -hmm. i'm sure she read the script right i'm sure she knew what was going on in the film and helped develop that character i don't have any evidence of that i just feel that probably and maybe Ann Wilson as well. I think the two of them, you know, they're a family. I, I think, I don't know if they're still married, but I would imagine that she had a lot of influence in this movie beyond just the music. I would imagine definitely, yeah. 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 Imagine if he started to go a certain a certain direction and she was like, no, that's bullshit. Yeah, it's interesting to think of the idea <laughs> that, uh, you know, it's Cameron Crowe's movie It's mm-hmm. and that William is Cameron Crowe, that maybe Ann Wilson is um, Penny Lane, even though Penny Lane is not a musician, she's, mm-hmm. a, she's a groupie. Mm-hmm. But Nancy and Anne both certainly know that world. I think Penny Lane, I mean, the reason I was so influenced by this character when I was 17 is because I think like that's essentially what women want to be in a sense that we want to be seen for who we are and we want to have our own story and we want to do things on our own terms, right? And we want to have fun on our own terms, it's so simple and basic, and yet nobody seems to understand that, especially men who write about women never mm-hmm. <laughs> seem to understand it. Right. Um, and the reason, I'll, I'll give you an example. The reason I'm saying this is because there is a moment where Russell tries to suck her into his cesspool of self-indulgent musician workness. <laughs> yes. And... There are several moments, actually, but the last one, he says something very typical of like a successful musician. It starts off like, when I'm around you, you know, I feel this way. It's not like, you know, I want to make you whatever, happy Mm -hmm. or, you know, what do you want? It's always like, I need you because you calm me, you inspire me. When I'm around you, I feel inspired. You know, that is the very common thing that musicians or artists say to women. And it's like, it's almost as if they don't see you as a person, they see you as inspiration, as some sort of tool for inspiration. They want a vampire. The muse, the idea is that of the muse. Yeah, And the muse is not something that women should aspire to be, and yet it's so celebrated. But that's the reality of the muse. Like your energy gets sucked out by this very selfish and indulgent person who thinks he's entitled to everything, all of your energy, who thinks that you should be there for all of his needs all the time. But he should also seek out inspiration elsewhere because he's doing such important work. He's inspired, you know, he's making this music, he's making this art. Well, so it's almost like then Russell's character... And he's not a horrible person. He's not. It's almost like he's trying to draw out the manic pixie dream. He is. And he fails. That she refuses. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what I was trying to say. Again, doesn't the film end with her leaving? Yeah. To Morocco. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's her film. Mm -hmm. What else can we say about it? Uh, I want to say one more thing about Frances McDormand. Yeah. (laughs) 
Again, she's just fantastic. It's, she, it's, a, it's a smallish part. She doesn't do, I mean, she doesn't do much. Like, she right. doesn't have plot. Mm-hmm. But yeah. And she's such an amazing actress. Mm-hmm. And um, the reason I was so touched by her this time around is because... When I was William's age, I didn't know how important her values were, you know? Her values are, you have to be a decent person. Don't do drugs. It sounds very simple and very, Mm -hmm. it sounds very cliche, but it's like, I didn't know how harmful drugs were when I was his age. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how important it was to have a stable career. I didn't know how important it was to have like a home and to be good to your family and to have good relationships with people and be a decent person and not, you know, leave a trail of destruction behind you everywhere you go, you know, that kind of thing. Um, When we're young, we tend to glamorize these things. But that's not the the life that I want anymore as an adult. Now that I think of it, it's like I, you know, I, I'm glad that somebody was there to guide me. Like, and and I think she reminded me of my own mother. Mm, yeah. And so, you know, she's a teacher, very respectable, you know, occupation. They're decent people. You know, she's like a decent person right. who's doing her best. And what I noticed this time around was that she gets it. She gets why he wants to go follow these rock stars around. I think she thinks very highly of him, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that is a great way to write about a woman, especially a mother. She's not the traditional, like, nitpicky. You know what I mean? Like, (laughs) somebody who doesn't get it. Because the mother is... She's not a helicopter mom. The mother is always somebody who doesn't get it, you know? And she's like... Well, and can be, the like, the butt of the joke or or be the foil to... Yeah. You know, she can be the the conservative restraint to, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. the need to Mm -hmm. fly. The the person who who is getting in the way, who doesn't get it, who doesn't understand anything, and who's at home, like, cooking biscuits all the time, and, you know, she just wants you to be home eating these biscuits. She's not that in this movie. I don't know, maybe it's because I'm approaching that age. I really liked seeing that. Well, I think, but I also think your relationship with your own mother has changed. Yes, definitely. So you see the movie in a different way. You say right. you see this movie Definitely. differently than yeah. you did when you were younger. I always saw her as somebody who was getting in the way of all of my fun. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> that's exactly the sacrifice <laughs> of parenting, I think. Um, and now I'm just like, thank God she got in the way of this fun that I was trying to have. But not in a way of restricting it. No. But thank God she was there. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So my sister Linda actually came up with this idea. Mm -hmm. She said, why don't you tell us what the next film is going to be so that when we're listening, we can then go watch the movie before your next podcast. Yes, that's a great idea. Uh, Why don't you tell us what the next movie is going to be? The next movie is going to be Mr. Holland's Opus. That's right. Mm -hmm. Which you've seen and I've never seen. Mm -hmm. So with that, thanks for listening. Mm -hmm. And if uh, you have a moment... We would really appreciate it if you share on social media platforms and give us a positive review. That would really help us boost the algorithm, I guess, although I don't know Boost the algorithm. We're all about boosting the algorithm The algorithm. All right. Well, thanks for listening, everyone, and we'll catch you again next time. Bye-bye. Under the moonlight, I'll sing you a song So you'd magically feel a lot less alone hopefully they'll live eternally if we paint ourselves all bright with stories of heroes and poets and sadness and war of immeasurable pain unconditional love Movies about music